Okay, so this is a set of questions on the alkenes topic. They're all multiple choice, all taken from AQA, A-level chemistry, past papers. I'm going to advise that you pause on the question, try to come up with the answer yourself, and then review what follows on the video so you can see how successfully you're tackling these questions and maybe which areas you need to go back and review. So let's start with question one. And we're jumping straight in with quite an unusual one, quite different. There's an extra component to this than you will often get on these questions. We want to know the major product of the reaction between 2-methylbutuene and iodine monochloride. So it's not something that we're familiar with, but we can work out enough about it to successfully answer this question. First of all, this is an electrophilic addition Re uh, reaction mechanism. We know that because we're starting with a double bond and we end up without a double bond. So we've broken the double bond and we've added things to either side of it. We also know that the double bond is susceptible to attack from electrophiles because it is electron rich. Now this is what the alkene looks like. And we need to decide what my electrophile is going to look like. So before I do it in the mechanism, I'm going to add, just on the left-hand side here, ICL. And you're familiar with this mechanism doing it with HBr, with Br2, or with HOSO3H, sulfuric acid. But this works in exactly the same way. We need to identify which of I and Cl are delta positive and delta negative. And chlorine is more delta negative. It's higher in the group. And we know that electronegativity decreases as you go down group seven. So with that in mind, I can now go ahead and do the mechanism in exactly the same way as I've always done. I have my arrow going from the double bond, the electron rich double bond to the I, which is delta positive, and then I get the ICL bond breaking and those electrons shifting to the chlorine. At that point, we have a Cl minus, which can attack the positive carbocation, and that is going to go in on the carbon that we can see we've identified as a carbocation. And I think it's important to note here that this is a tertiary carbocation. If the I had gone on that carbon, we would have been left with a secondary carbocation intermediate. And tertiary carbocation intermediates are more stable and therefore lead to the more, more likely product, the major product. Correct answer is C. Next question. So this is a question that relates to polymers. Uh, we can take a look at some of the answers here. Um, <clears throat> its polymer chain contains alternate single and double bonds. Well, no, this is an addition polymer. And what that means is that the double bond breaks. So we end up with only single bonds in our polymer chain. It dechlorizes bromine water. Well, no, it's monomer wood, but because it has no double bond, it will not get a positive test for alkenes. It will not decolorize the brown bromine water. And the empirical formula CHCl, well, if I draw the repeating unit, you can see that has two Cs, three Hs, and a Cl. So it is certainly not what we would want to say is the empirical formula. So that leaves us with C, brittleness reduced by plasticizers. And you could possibly have jumped straight to that answer. But Essentially, we do use plasticizers to reduce brittleness in polymers to make them more suitable for various uses. Okay, next question. So on this, I would always draw the structure out. To do that, you need to know a number of things, actually. You need to know that pent means that it's a carbon chain of five, that it's an ene, so it has a double bond, and that's on the second carbon. And that there's a hydroxy, which is the prefix we use for an alcohol where we can't use the suffix. And that's on the fourth carbon. So I have numbered from left to right here. I can then fill in the remainder of the hydrogens. 
Now from there, I can work out my ratio C to H to O. And I see that I've got five to 10 to one. Now, that's my molecular formula, but I can't simplify that. I can't divide it down because I can't take O1 any smaller. So the correct answer is B. Next question. And we're back to the idea here of carbocations. I've already touched on the idea of primary, secondary, tertiary carbocations, but let's put that into practice here. And let's take a look at the mechanism itself. I've got my HBr, my H is delta positive. I've got my electron rich double bond. So of course, I'm going to get the curly arrow going from the double bond to the delta positive H, always from electron deficient to electron rich. That breaks the HBr bond and those electrons go on to the bromine to make Br minus. But at this point, there are two possible ways that it could go. I could end up with my H being added on the left hand carbon or the middle carbon. And that would leave the carbocation on the other one, as we can see here. Now from there, I can see that I've got a secondary carbocation on the left and a primary carbocation on the right. Secondary carbocations are more stable. It's because of something called the inductive effect, where that positive charge draws electrons into it from the bonds surrounding it and it makes it more stable. And that means it can exist longer to allow the product where the Br- comes in to be formed. So because that's the case, my carbocation is going to be C, my secondary carbocation. Next question. And we are naming. Now, <clears throat> very easy to go wrong on this because lots of people will look and see one, two, three, four carbons going along the top. I've got an ethyl coming off it, but remember you find the longest carbon chain. And the longest carbon chain has been highlighted. So this is a pent, it's a pentene. So I can immediately disregard B and C. If I then number it, as I've done here, and I've not put all of the numbers on, but that gives me my pent 2-ene. I'm going to number it to give me the lowest possible alkene value. I can then see that I've got a methyl on the third carbon and a bromo on the second carbon. So my correct answer is A. Next question. And on this, we are looking at geometrical isomers. We've got E1,2-dichloroethene. Let's take a look through and see what we can disregard. Well, between 400 and 1500 cm to the minus one on an infrared spectrum is the fingerprint region. And the whole, the, the, the most important principle of the fingerprint region is that it's unique to a particular compound. So for that reason, the fingerprint region would never be the same for those two. There would be some differences. So that's not the answer. It won't have a different molecular iron peak because it's still got the same relative molecular mass. So it's not D. It won't have the same boiling point. And that's actually because the bonds are arranged differently. There's a different arrangement in space and that can affect the surface area and that can therefore affect the intermolecular forces that exist between them. So there will be differences in boiling point. So we know what the correct answer is. <clears throat> um, it forms a polymer with the same repeating unit as Z12-dichloroethene. Now I've drawn up at the top here my repeating unit. And I think the key thing to remember here is once you get the repeating unit, the double bond has been broken. So we do now have free rotation. So for that reason, the repeating unit is identical. <laughs>